good to be here with all of you today. This Easter Sunday, as it has been called, our people around the world today are celebrating this thing called Easter. And when we open up our Bible and we read from the New Testament, uh, we don't find any reference to the word Easter or to uh, a celebration of it. And yet, there's a reason that the resurrection is important. So this morning, we're going to find out what the fuss is about. As we discuss six significances of the resurrection. From the moment that God created mankind, we can count the far-reaching tragedies that have resulted from mankind's decision to sin. Adam and Eve were banished from the garden because the aid of the fruit. Now, I want to take a moment. I was reading a bulletin, and it said that Adam and Eve were not kicked out of the garden because of what they did, but because of what they might do or could do. And that's true. But the only way that that, that scripture reference from Genesis 3, the later part of the chapter, the only way that they can become like God is because they had already eaten of the fruit. But from the beginning of time, Man has chosen to rebel against God. Adam and Eve chose to rebel. Consequently, they were thrown from the garden. Noah's neighbors were destroyed, consumed in a worldwide flood. There's a movie about that uh, that came out recently. Because of the continually evil thoughts and intentions of their hearts, we read in Genesis 6 and verse 5. Sodom and Gomorrah were obliterated because God could not find even ten righteous people among their thousands, according to Genesis 18. And Jesus died on the cross because of the envy, the jealousy, the hard-heartedness, and the sins of mankind. Our sins, our rebellion against God. So dark was this point in history when mankind not only rejected but also murdered the one who created us the sun ceased to shine for three hours. But there's hope. For just as the S-U-N rose again after three hours, the S-O-N rose again after three days. And so today we discuss six significances of the resurrection. Brother Allen read for us from Mark chapter 15, verses 42 to 47. Now we're going to pick up in Mark 16.1, where he left off. Mark 16.1, I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices, so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us and from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. In entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in the white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, but they were afraid. Jesus arose. He was crucified, and he arose from the grave. And that he arose, Jesus' resurrection means it is significant because, first of all, he overcame death, sin, and Satan. These powers. That man alone cannot overcome. We discussed it this morning in Bible class. That as mankind, as people, we don't realize just how powerful death, sin, and Satan are. We don't realize how much sin affects our relationship with our God. But because Jesus arose, he overcame death. He overcame sin. And ultimately, he overcame Satan for us. That Jesus arose means that he overcame death. 
that, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let us read verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Let's start at verse 8. 2 Timothy 1, 8. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, verse 10, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That Jesus was resurrected means that he overcame death. That Jesus was resurrected also means that he overcame sin. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. Here Paul, quoting poetry. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that Jesus rose from the grave means ultimately that he overcame Satan. This we read in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of Christ, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. To call Jesus Savior is to claim that he saves others from something. All of mankind, because of our choice to sin, to rebel against God, means that we need to be saved. We need to be redeemed from the powers of sin and death and Satan. But because Jesus already overcame those powers himself, he can help us overcome them as well. Jesus' bodily resurrection means, first of all, that he overcame death, sin, and Satan. But Jesus' resurrection also means that he is who he claimed to be. Three times Jesus foretold his death and resurrection in the book of Mark. First in Mark 8, 31, second in Mark 9, 30, 32, and finally in Mark 10, which we're going to read together. Mark 10, 33, and 34. This is the last time that Jesus foretells of his death, according to Mark. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will arise. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the creator of the earth. And as a result of these claims, some have come to say this, Jesus must have either been a lunatic, a liar, or he must have been who he claimed to be, the Lord. He was either crazy, he was just insane, he was a talented deceiver and liar, or he was who he claimed to be. The resurrection demonstrates that he truly is the Lord. Many have claimed to be something that they're not. A few years ago, uh, there was a woman advertising on television. I was, a, I was a child at the time. Some of you may have seen uh, this advertisement. Her name was Miss Cleo. And for a nominal fee, you could call Miss Cleo and she would tell you your future. She was a, a by phone sidekick. But after so much time of doing this, Miss Cleo was found out to be a fraud and spent some time in prison. She was a liar. The Second World War focused around the powers of Germany and their and Japan and their followers. And 
the United States and Europe and our followers, but it all came down to one man. A man who thought he would revolutionize the culture and way of life in Germany. And Adolf Hitler was a lunatic. But Jesus Christ, born the Son to Mary, virgin, laid in a manger, lived in Galilee, claimed to be the Son of God. He was crucified on a Roman cross. But on the third day, he rose again. And he showed by that resurrection that he was not a liar. He was not crazy. But he truly is the Lord. First of all, we see that the resurrection means Jesus overcame death, sin, and Satan. And it also